Hi, everybody. This is uh, Tom Shade, and this is the Lively Tradition blog, and we're talking today with Susan Frederick Gray, who is the lead minister of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Phoenix, Arizona, and she is also one of the candidates for the president of the Unitarian Universalist Association. And this is the first of a series of interviews I'm going to be doing with all of the candidates, maybe more than one interview, but... Today we're talking to Susan Frederick Gray. Susan, uh, hello. How are hello, you? Hello, Tom. I'm doing well. I'm glad to be here. You're uh, in Phoenix now. Is that your office that we see? Yes. Okay. Great. Yeah. Great. So, uh, first question I have. Um, I'm always interested in what people were doing in their young adult life. I think that's kind of where you see the competing pressures in people's lives and their motivations come out most uh, clearly. They uh, generally have a little more freedom at that point. They're making choices. They don't have a lot of money, so their choices are a little bit more uh, careful. But that's a time I think that uh, people uh, begin, to, you begin to see the adult truly in that young adult period. So reading your bio, bio I saw that you went the University of Wisconsin, and you were studying biology, and you got the call to ministry. So, and then you went right to seminary. You went to Harvard Divinity School. So tell me about that period, and tell me about what was going on in your life, and why the call to ministry, and just tell us about that time. Okay, great question. Well, so I, as a child, I wanted to be an engineer. And that in high school developed and in middle school developed into an interest in genetics and evolution. I think I've always been curious about how things work. And so I went to college to study molecular cell biology. I didn't want to be a doctor. I was in the pre-med program. I wanted to be a genetic researcher. I wanted to work on cures for disease. And I actually started college at the University of California, Berkeley. Now, I'm, mm. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. So I went from the Midwest all the way to California. At that time in my life, I was in, in high school, finishing high school. I had fallen in love for the first time mm. with a great UU kid from the neighboring congregation and um, went off to Berkeley to study molecular biology. And that transition was very difficult for me. I was very far from home. I felt I made great friends, but I didn't feel settled. It was difficult to have all that freedom. And at Berkeley, specifically undergraduate education was very under-resourced. So all of my classes in that first semester and that first year had over 500 students in them, all my science classes. And I, I didn't realize how important the relationship that I had with a professor or a teacher was to my learning. And so I didn't go to class enough. Um, I found lots of distractions in San Francisco, lots of music to go see, all kinds of fun things. And I knew that wasn't gonna, I, I knew that wasn't serving me. And I also had this broken heart and you oh. know, it was a lot of sadness, um, even depression. Um, yeah. Just because of that, it was such a big time of change. So. I decided to transfer to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which had been my second choice of uh -huh. school, and it was closer to home, and uh -huh. I felt like I needed to start again. I wanted to graduate on time. The other thing that was happening was I wasn't sure this molecular biology path was the right one for me. Hmm. I, the lab work, I had, I think, two or three five-hour labs a week uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> in my course of studies, and I would leave the lab with my shoulders hurting and just a headache. And I thought, this is, not, this is not right. This isn't what I thought it would be. So I went to Wisconsin in January. It was a big change from California. I <laughs> so bet. I snowed a foot the day, the day my dad <laughs> arrived, dropping me off there. Um, well, yeah, now, you said you, went to Wisconsin, you transferred to Wisconsin because it was less fun, right? So that's a great advertisement for a school. <laughs> go on, go on. Yes. January, um, snowfall. There no, you go. and it wasn't that it was less fun, but it was closer to home, and that oh, was important to me. Yeah. 
And so I started a regular meditation practice. I mm. suspect I learned about meditation in RE in, in the Unitarian Universalist congregation, but I started a practice of sitting and I was asking myself, what is my path? Where is my joy? What, you know, what am I meant to do? I thought it was molecular biology. It's clearly not. Um, and I stuck with the degree because I wanted to graduate on time and I knew I could get a job uh -huh. <laughs> with a molecular biology degree. Uh, so I kept that coursework, but about, but I started to have this call uh -huh. through the meditation practice. Three things came to me really clearly. The first was that working in community, working with people gave me energy. The second thing was wanting to make, wanting to contribute to make the world a better place. And that was a part of my um, interest in molecular biology and research. So that was still very much a part of what was coming to me as important. And then the third thing was very clearly, I had this sense that I wanted there to be more love in the world. Mm. Not romantic love, but mm. agape love, love of, humanity, um, love that brings wholeness and justice. So I didn't know what job that was. Uh -huh. <laughs> I really did have a sense of clarity and I thought about politics, I thought about social work, teaching, law, all kinds of things and nothing seemed to fit that criteria. And it was several months later I was um, talking to my mom and just sharing with her that I felt like this seemed really clear and I didn't know what this, what this was what job this was and she said to me sounds like you're talking about ministry huh. And, huh. You no know, it really was like bells i mean it was yeah. like oh i never had even considered that and huh. you know and i sat with that and and it it, it hooked me in a way and it terrified me in another way uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. but who am i who am i i would never have enough to say um, but it, it wouldn't let me go. And I talked to John Robinson, who was the minister at Elliott Chapel, where I grew up, made a meeting with him, talked with him about how I was feeling. He was, he was affirming uh -huh. of the call, talked with uh -huh. Earl Holt in, uh -huh. at the first church in St. Louis. He also was encouraging, um, talked to a community minister whose kids I babysat for, who had uh -huh. gone to the ministry second career. And I received a lot of affirmation. So I, applied to seminary. I finished that molecular biology degree. I worked in the field. I actually took a year off between, mm -hmm. uh, well, I graduated college early. So I took a year and a half off, um, went to India, did, you know, I could tell you more stories about that, but, um, applied to seminary, mm -hmm. applied to seminary. And, and once I was there, it, it, it continued to feel like the right place, the studies, the classes, the community, Everything felt like I was in the right place. So you were in uh, in the Elliott Chapel uh, mm -hmm. uh, in Kirkwood, Missouri. Yeah. John Robinson was the minister there. That's somebody yeah. I know. Uh, if people don't know him, John Robinson is, you know, kind of one of the giants of that generation ahead of mine, mm -hmm. at least in terms of ministry, if not in age. Mm -hmm. um, and. Um, so what was it like growing up in that church? What was, what did, how did Unitarian Universalism, uh, or what did you understand about Unitarian Universalism as a child growing up? What was it, what was the main message that you were getting mm. as a child? And also, then the other part would be, what was the main message you were getting as who a minister was? It's interesting to me that you have it that being a minister was not something that actually had to be suggested from outside your uh, experience. That wasn't where you thought uh, you were. It was your mom that says, uh, you always listen to your mom when they say things like this, but go ahead. <laughs> so what was that like? Tell me about uh, Elliott Chapel, Kirkwood. This would have been the 1980s and 90s, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it started in the 70s, 70s but yeah. 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 Um, so my first memories of Elliott Chapel are from when I was probably five years old in kindergarten. Mm. Um, my, I remember my Sunday school teachers, mm. Gardner and BJ Limegrubler. And this time, and we can talk about this more, but my 
part of what brought us to Unitarian Universalism, my parents before I was born, and was my mom becoming active in the women's rights movement in the 70s. And she was working on the ERA and she was invited to speak at Elliott Chapel and to gather signatures. And she thought, what? A church is inviting a woman to talk about the ERA? What on earth? And they had been church shopping, Presbyterian, various different things. I was um, not born yet. And when they came to the Unitarian Church at Elliott, they felt at home. And so that was sort of their first entry. Well, feminism, that, I, that change in my mom, that... Uh -huh fundamentally changed the relationship between my parents and they had to radically renegotiate uh -huh. so much of their relationship and it was not easy uh -huh. so, as a very young child my parents marriage was in a in a difficult place uh -huh. and what i remember about bj and tim in sunday school and they um, they were married was that they clearly loved each other and had joy and so what i mean i do believe that unitarian universalism saved my life mm. because elliott mm. chapel was a place of joy it was a home away from home there were adults who cared about me and knew me and that made a huge difference when things at home felt very uncertain and unstable mm. Mm. so um that was that's what i think about when i think about the congregation is my RE teachers, my youth advisors when I was in high school, um, my friends, and, um, and just feeling like that was a home away from home, safe, joyful, um, mm -hmm. it, was, it was incredibly important. So that's, that's what I think about. Um, my sister is still a member there with her kids. My parents are long-term members there and mm. leadership. So Hi. Do I, you know, I, and I, I led service there as a youth. I was on a youth adult council for the district. So there was also leadership development, lots of leadership development that happened there. Mm -hmm. I actually what? preached my first sermon there after this call to ministry, but before I went to seminary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, that's, I mean, I, many people have that experience of preaching as a youth, which kind of sets off a little uh, ticking time bomb that may explode <laughs> later in their life. Uh, that was yeah. true for me. Hmm. Um, I, I noticed that uh, that one of the uh, themes in your uh, materials about the candidacy for presidency is the importance of the uh, the emotional culture of the local congregation. Mm -hmm. And I'm hearing now where that was so important to you, that experience of joy, support, uh, inclusive togetherness and in, in that experience. Uh, interesting, interesting. These things carry all, all the way through. Um, tell, me about, tell me about your family. I understand, you know, um, kind of the social class. Did you grow up in a diverse environment? Was it, uh, you know, what was your experience with privilege and oppression and those kinds of things as a child? Yeah, so um, I grew up in a white middle class family mm -hmm. um, that became um, affluent, not highly affluent, but mm -hmm. um, affluent. My mom went to law school when I was two years old. So mm -hmm. I told you about the transition in their marriage. Mm -hmm. um, so once she entered law school and then became an attorney, there were two um, profession. My dad's an engineer. There were two mm -hmm. professional incomes in the house. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that increased the um, affluence of the family. We lived in, uh, I went to public school in Kirkwood. Mm -hmm. uh, Kirkwood has become increasingly less diverse than it was when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. But my high school and elementary schools were about, were around 12% African American. Mm -hmm. And um, eighty-five percent white, mm -hmm. and a few percentages of um, Latino families, Vietnamese families, uh, families of Asian descent. Mm -hmm. So um, that was the makeup of my high school, and that was probably more diverse than Kirkwood itself. There was desegregation busing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
to Kirkwood from the city of St. Louis. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, so very much, I mean, I grew up with a lot of, with two parents who were, went to college, um, with mm-hmm. strong financial resources. Um, Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What was yeah what was interesting in going to berkeley i mean berkeley was one of the most was the most diverse environment i'd ever been in mm-hmm. there at 18 mm-hmm. that was a huge um benefit of that experience mm-hmm. um so tell me about uh what are the what are the through lines of your mm. personal faith. I mean, you talk about your a meditation practice. I'd like to hear more about going to India, what that was like, and kind of uh, are, are there um, practices, beliefs, uh, approaches that you can trace through from high school or earlier on through to into your ministry? Yeah. Um, Probably a couple. Let me start with one, and then um, we can maybe take another uh, mm-hmm. another one. The importance of courage and justice mm. are strong trends uh, throughout my life. So, I was named. I was born Susan Elizabeth Gray. Okay. My mom named me, my, mo- my parents named me Susan Elizabeth after Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Oh my, okay. So I often say, no pressure, mom. <laughs> right? No pressure there. Um, and, you know, that, and then after my mom named me Susan, she was telling her aunt that she'd named me after Susan B. Anthony and discovered that Susan B. Anthony is my fifth great aunt. Oh my goodness. And really? so we, and so my aunt said, Oh, I have some of Susan's things. I'll give them to you. Oh my. So, I mean, this is, so that sense of connection to that history of the women's suffrage movement was powerful throughout my life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. My mom, when I would come home in elementary school, and even into middle school and high school, the first thing my mom would do was take my history book and she'd look in the index and she'd look for Susan B. Anthony and she'd look for Sojourner Truth. She'd look for Ida B. Welch. She'd look for Elizabeth Cady Stanton or Lucy Stone. She'd look for these women to see if they were even in the history book. Mm -hmm. And then often she was disappointed Mm -hmm. because they weren't. And so she'd supplement my education. But the other thing she was teaching me necessarily but that everything's not in the history book mm-hmm, mm-hmm. histories have a perspective mm-hmm. and much gets lost or erased so mm-hmm. that was an important thing i um and i want to name that i know even in the context of the women's suffrage movement that that was not a perfect movement and that the analysis around race mm-hmm. and oppression was not mm-hmm efficiently or even deeply a part of that movement. So I, mm-hmm. I want to name that, but I didn't know that as a child. And what mm-hmm. I knew was I was named after these women who were courageous and who fought for women's equality and women's mm-hmm. right to vote. And so that was, I always give, whenever I have faced something that's made me afraid, including ministry, mm-hmm. standing up to Joe Arpaio, mm-hmm. including all kinds of things, I have, I have called back on, mm-hmm. Susan B. Anthony as my namesake and as a part of my family history, give me courage. So that's, uh, that's mm. definitely a part, been a part of my story. I love also my mom used to all the, used to change the genders of the heroes in the children's books. <laughs> so, we read as kids. so instead of the prince, it was the princess and the queen and, you know, the, the sisters instead of the brothers. And, oh. and it, told me that, you know, you get to write your own story. And, you know, mm-hmm. there's, mm-hmm. that, all of that was so influential, I think, um, for me as a woman, as a young girl. Um, you know, the first <laughs> protests I led was in high school. Uh-huh. Because in gym class, the gym teacher wouldn't let, we, you know, co-ed gym class. Right. But the girls were not allowed to, we're, learning softball and I was on the junior varsity softball team at the time. I think it was a sophomore 
and the girls weren't allowed to catch, to pitch, or to play third base because we could get hurt. Right. But there were three of us who were on the JV softball team, and this is, you know, gym class. So there is a whole range of athleticism. Yeah, yeah. So, so I told the teacher I, I wasn't going to play until I could play wherever I wanted because I played third base and I caught for the softball team. We had a pitcher on the team. It didn't make sense. We couldn't play. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, she threatened to fail me. And oh, I my. I was like, it's okay, you can fail me. Like, you know, this is okay. And we had to go to the principal. And of course, the principal said, you cannot, this is discriminatory. Yeah. yeah. Whatever they want. So, you know, and obviously I'm known for a lot of my justice work here in Phoenix. And mm -hmm. that's been a part of um, my story throughout. I was, when I went to Berkeley, one of the things that was interesting is there there was no organized that I could find. When I went to all this, the student group meeting, the largest group was the Young Republicans. There, this was a kind of um, conservative swing in California. They had Prop 287, which was an anti-immigrant bill. There was no Amnesty International group. Mm -hmm. At Berkeley, I couldn't find kind of young organizing uh, progressives at Berkeley, mm -hmm. which was very interesting. So that was something I got involved in in Wisconsin a little bit mm -hmm. more there, certainly with Amnesty International. But um, anyway, so that's one thread line. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they're proud and it was sort of was, was a foundation put mm -hmm. there. So uh, tell me also about the meditation. Was that a, yeah. uh, something that started in high school or in college or what? How long did you do that? Are you still doing that? Is that sure, sure. Um, it started during that call to ministry. Mm -hmm. It started when I went to Wisconsin and I started this uh, meditation practice. I didn't have a teacher then. I just lit a candle and sat mm -hmm. in silence. Um, in seminary, I, and then, you know, certainly I explored that in India. Mm -hmm. Um, and different, it, it, I was visiting temples, various mm -hmm. holy places, met the Dalai Lama. That was oh amazing. That was amazing. Good. Yeah. Um, and then I, um, in the seminary, I started a Qigong practice, which is mm -hmm. energy healing work. And um, there was a uh, person in Boston who was teaching an evening class um, at Harvard Divinity School. So I took that, which got me, you know, which helped me see the value of motion and movement in meditation. And I kept that up after I moved to Nashville to do my internship from Boston, but without a teacher, it slowly faded away. Um, mm -hmm. And then I actually picked up, so I didn't have a strong practice for several mm -hmm. years until I started doing living by heart. Mm -hmm. Oral Hallman came and did a program for the Ohio Meadville district ministers. Mm -hmm. I was in Youngstown and I started the living by heart practice. And mm -hmm. so today I actually have two different practices. I, I start with just a simple yoga stretches mm -hmm. in the morning. And then I do, um, I do about a 30 minute meditation and 15 mm -hmm. minutes living by heart. I sit with poems. I learn poems by heart um, in the discernment for mm -hmm. thinking about the UUA presidency. I sat mm -hmm. with, Discernment poem from Rilke, mm -hmm. and and then the other fifteen I've started just more typical Buddhist mm -hmm. meditation practice, and I work with a spiritual director and mm -hmm. connect on that. So that's a daily practice, and that's been a part of my life for years and years. Mm -hmm. I was doing the Justice GA work, um, and I worked for the association half time. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to work full time, and I really felt I knew my call was to Phoenix. So, mm -hmm. half time for the UUA. That was when, um, like, I started to really put that practice right at the beginning of the day every day because I, I knew I wouldn't mm -hmm. be able to do all of that work and to do it well without being grounded in spiritual practice. So that's that's just continued. It's just made a part of my life since then. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. I mean, uh, very interesting. Uh, just a few last. Uh, um, that was actually my last question. So. <laughs> oh, okay. But uh, you know, the things I'm hearing here are uh, just 
you know, the importance of uh, community, the importance that you identify um, ministry with uh, courage, mm -hmm. and that um, you want to know how things work. Yeah. And um, I think those are excellent qualities for the presidency of the Unitarian Universalist Association. And so, uh, I look forward to talking with you more and uh, hearing more about it. And I definitely want to talk to you about your ministry in Youngstown, Ohio, because that was my home church growing up. Yeah. So, so we'll talk about that and uh, go down that memory lane. But uh, thank you very much for talking with us today. And uh, hopefully we'll talk again as this campaign develops. And um, it was a great pleasure to meet you. Thank you, Tom. It was wonderful to be here with you. Thank you.